You know, you guys, those of you who follow me on Facebook, um, I, I use Facebook as a tool. I, I, you know, I do every once in a while scroll and read, but 95% of the things, 99% of the things that I put on Facebook are, are for um, encouraging people, um, spreading information about what's happening at the church, things like that. Um, every once in a while when something happens in our life, I'll post that. But again, it's so you guys you know, could pray for us if you want. Um, you know, was it a, two weeks ago Saturday your mom died? Two weeks ago Saturday, as most of you know, Jeanette's mom passed away. And so we went, we flew up or flew down to Atlanta uh, for the funeral. And while we were in Atlanta, Eli decided that he wanted to get sick. Now, I love my wife. And she is much better at taking care of Eli than I am. Um, we learned through this last couple of weeks that you usually got sick three days after you actually con- you actually caught whatever virus it was. So Eli got sick on Thursday. If you do the math, I mean, count days backwards, you'll find that he actually caught whatever it was on Monday. Jeanette flew down to Atlanta on Saturday. I flew down to Atlanta on Monday with Eli. Dirty plane. Don't think about baby wipes all the time. Eli's sticking his hands in his mouth. Now, I'm sure that if Eli would have been with Jeanette, he wouldn't have got sick. But I'm dad, and that happens. So he gets sick on Thursday, and it's terrible. I mean, middle of the night. And again, this is one of those things moms, moms do that dads sometimes, you know. Middle, it's, 12, it's 12 o'clock, and Jeanette jumps up out of bed. And I'm like going, what's wrong? What's wrong? She actually heard Eli throw up in the middle of the night, and it woke her up. And I'm, didn't wake me up. Her moving around in the bed woke me up. We go, and it was pretty bad, and we clean it up and everything. And uh, I end up laying on the other bed in the hotel room with Eli just in case he um, had to throw up again. I wanted to be, had a bucket with me. We were all ready. Um, he never did. I mean, he, he never, nothing ever came out of his mouth again, and so that was good. But uh, I remember praying while I was laying next to him in bed. I remember praying, uh, and if, if, you, if you don't have children, you might not quite understand this, but I remember praying, okay, God, I don't want him to feel sick. So I'm willing, I'm willing to take his sickness as long as he gets better. I remember that, that thought process going through my head, talking to God about that. I said, I'm willing to do that. And so, you know, I didn't think anything of it. Um, you know, he, uh, the, the rest of the night, uh, into the morning, he was feeling pretty fine. In the morning, we got up, he ate some, some breakfast, and he seemed to be his jolly little self, and then a little later on, he puked. And, uh, and so I says, well, he didn't, get, he didn't get well when I talked to God. That's not... So that led me to believe, I'm not going to get sick. Well... That was Thursday. Fast forward to Sunday. Um, Jeanette, last Sunday, uh, if you didn't notice, she left in the middle of service last Sunday. I, I kind of made an announcement at the end of service. But she got sick. I mean, all day Sunday. Oh, by the way, congratulations to Paul, um, who won the, uh, there he is, yeah. Paul won the carpet tournament last, last week. Um, but he only won. I want to, yeah, give him a good time. He only won because I had to go home and take care of my wife. I just want to... That's the advantage of being a pastor and having a microphone. You could say whatever. Uh, No. So I took care of Jerry, Jeanette, and Eli while while she was sick. And um, then, you know, uh, like I said, three days later, because that's how it works. Eli got sick on Thursday. Three days later, Jeanette got sick. Sunday. Three days later which is Wednesday, guess what I did? I got sick. And, you know, I'm still, uh, I'm still not over it. I don't know what this is, but this, 
this, this illness has been kicking my butt. Can I say that on Sunday morning? <laughs> this, this illness has been kicking my glutes maximus. That just doesn't sound right, does it? That's okay. So, <clears throat> but in all of that, I realized, you know, that I was willing, because my love for Eli, I was willing to keep him from suffering by taking on whatever it is that he had. Now, if I knew it was going to be as bad as it was, I might have kind of second thought it, but no, I still would have. Why? Because I love him. You know, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about it would be nice if there was a human being around here who loved me enough when I got really sick like that, who could just come over to me and, and shake my hand and say, hey, hey, Pastor Steve, I love you, and I know you're sick, so I want to take that from you. Give me a good handshake, and then all of my illnesses would go into him. And he could be sick for me, and then I don't have to be sick. Wouldn't that be awesome? Every time you started feeling sick, you had somebody come along who all they had to do was shake your hand and, and you could give them your illness and you don't have to be sick anymore. Who would like that? Some of you, some of you like illnesses? Really? I would love that. I think it would be awesome. Unfortunately, in the life we live, in the world we live, and the technology we have prohibits us that from happening. Now, we can share it we can share it. My wife was kind enough to share her, her, her illness with me, and thank you very much, babe. I love you. We can share it, but, but we can't just remove it from ourselves and give it to somebody else. But there is one thing. There is an illness that we all have that we can give away. There is a sickness that resides within all of us that, that somebody can come into our, into our lives and remove. But for them to remove that from our lives, they have to take it upon themselves. If you have your Bibles with me, um, turn to John chapter 3. This is going to be a familiar passage, probably one that everybody has read at least, this, at least one, this one verse everybody has read. John chapter 3, we're going to read verses 16 through 21. It says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that they may be seen plainly, so it may be seen plainly that they have done what they had done has been done in the sight of God. There's a lot of stuff in there. This is some good preaching material. Uh, I just don't have time to preach all of this that's in here, but I want to focus on a couple of ideas as we look in here. I'm starting a new series today called He Came. This is Easter, this is Easter month. I love Easter month. Easter is the most exciting time, not only for a church, but for Christians, as we remember that Jesus is no longer dead. Um, we are going to be doing a couple of things this coming Saturday. We are, um, we're doing what we call Fam Jam. And we're going to be setting up in the park over here. We're going to have some bounce houses. We're going to be giving away hot dogs. And, and we're going to be having other games. We'll get some prizes we're going to be ready. I think we're going to try and do, a, um, we're trying to do what is it, cakewalk? You sit in a circle and you walk around, and if you're the last one, you get a free cake. Um, we're going to be doing all kinds of stuff, giving away free stuff, because we want to bless our community. But we also want to share the love of Jesus with them and invite them back to our Easter service. So here's what I want you to do. 
I want you to be praying this week um, about God, God just doing a work, not only this weekend, this Saturday when we have Fam Jam, but also when we have our Easter service. If you look in the back of the rooms, you'll see that uh, we have some chairs stacked up against the wall. We're going to add a few more rows of chairs in here because I am anticipating having a packed house in here. Um, but we need to be praying that God moves on people's lives. But prayer is the first step. The second step is that we need to do something about it. We need to pray, but we need to do something about it. So if you want to help us out, this Saturday, we're going to be, the, the Fam Jam is going to go from 11 to 2 o'clock. And so we, we're going to need a couple of people. It's not really going to be hard to do. We're going to have a, um, we're going to have a game, and if you, you just run the game. Like, you know, we'll have a couple of, uh, we'll have a bounce house and a, and a blow-up obstacle course. And so maybe you'll be running that. Maybe you'll be handing out hot dogs. I mean, it'll be something fairly simple. You won't have a lot of organization that you have to do. All you do is have your time and then love on kids when they come. It's a way for us to love our community and have the opportunity to build a relationship so we can invite them back and really share what Jesus has done to them, done for them in their lives. And so uh, that's cool, uh, and, and I'm excited about that. But we, well, one of the things we don't think about when we think of uh, of Easter is we don't necessarily focus on Jesus coming. We focus on Jesus being victorious. And the series this month that I'm doing is called He. On the front of your bulletins, that's what it says, big O H and E, He. That is my series. Today we're going to look at He Came. Tomorrow we're going to look at, or next Sunday we're going to look at He Saw. And then on Easter Sunday we're going to look at He. You guys are good. He came, he saw, he conquered. Today, he came. Why did Jesus come? Well, it's pretty obvious. He came to save the world. We see that in, in verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to give them the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus came to save the world. But there's something, there's something interesting about him coming to save the world. And the first thing is that he came to save the world... And, but it didn't matter the cost. The cost didn't matter. We have different views about things, about what is valuable and what is not valuable, uh, about how much we're willing to pay for something and how much we're not willing to pay for. Like take, for instance, sour cream. I'm not willing to pay anything for sour cream because I hate sour cream. Sour cream is nasty, let's be honest. Peanut butter, on the other hand, peanut butter is worth its weight in gold. All right? So, it, you know, it, 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 but we, we, we value things. We put things, how much are these things worth? And Jesus realized, uh, he believed, not realized, he believed that your life was so important that he was willing to save it no matter what the cost is. We have that. And sometimes as Christians, we, we, we know that and we believe that. But sometimes we still don't quite feel like that victorious person that we should be. And Jesus just wants to remind you, hey, I already did all the work. I did everything. All you have to do is rest in my will, rest in my peace, and, and live a blessed life. He came to save the world, and he didn't care about the cost. It was a costly, but and here's the thing we, we sometimes don't understand. It was a costly thing. Not just the physical aspect of his death. If you've, seen, if you've ever seen The Passion of the Christ, that is probably the, the best uh, movie I've ever seen to, to give you a clear image of the physical suffering that, that Christ went through when he died on the cross. But that wasn't, that wasn't the most severe suffering that Jesus faced when he died on the cross. 
the, the, the most severe thing that Jesus faced was a separation from the Father. We, we call that spiritual death. When somebody dies on this earth and they don't have a relationship with Jesus, they face spiritual death. They face spiritual separation from God. So when Jesus died on the cross, he faced a sense of spiritual death, separation from the Father that he'd never noticed before. Think about something that you've had in your life your whole life, something that is valuable to you that, you, that you could not imagine life without, and all of a sudden, it's not there anymore. How devastating that would be. Jeanette and I have been married um, for many years now. <laughs> to do the math in my head. We're going on 14 years. I, I know the answer to that. <clears throat> um, all I have to do is add 10 years to Eli's birthday, or to Eli's age. And so I got, God blessed me because he knew my memory is shot. We're going on 14 years now, and uh, um, I realized when I went on this, these two week, this 12-day trip to Israel, I don't like being away from my wife. Just don't like it. I realized that after two days. No, no offense to Joe. I roomed with Joe. Uh, no offense to Joe. Um, I, I, just, I just don't like to, but to, to imagine. And I was able to talk to her every day, FaceTime with her and Eli. The, the biggest suffering Jesus faced was not the physical torture that he endured. It was the separation. Albeit he knew it was a temporary separation. But that didn't make it pleasant. And he was willing to do that because he loves you. As an individual. Not, not you as a church. He does love you as a church. But he loves you as an individual. With all of the the doubts that you may have, with all of the sins that you may commit, with, with all of the suffering that you endure, with all of the pain that you find in your life, he loves you. And he doesn't wait for you to love him back. Paul writes that he loved us while we were still sinners. He died for us. He didn't wait for you to do something amazing and, oh, I love you. doesn't matter the cost. He was willing to do it. And he came to save the world even if you were the only one that would accept what he had. That's how precious you as an individual are to God. That's how much Jesus loves you as an individual. He came to save the world. But you know, a lot of us know that. A lot of us live our lives on a regular basis um, knowing that he came to save the world, having a relationship with him. We live our lives uh, blessed even by him. But there's another thing that he came to do um, and that is he came to set the captives free. He came to set captives free. And while I do believe that, that he came to set captives free who are in bondage and don't know him as his personal savior, we as Christians often find ourselves captive in our lives. Even though we have a relationship with, with Jesus, even though we've committed our life to him, even though we daily give our lives over to Jesus, there are still things in our lives that we find we are held captive by. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. says this, Then Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, 
was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim deliverance to the captives and recover the sight of the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, returned it to the attendant, sat down, and everyone, in the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began by saying, Today... This scripture was fulfilled in your hearing. What was he saying when he, when he says that? He was the one who was going to bring deliverance to the captives. He was the one who was going to bring recovery to the sight of the blind, to release the oppressed. That's what Jesus came to do. To bring us freedom, not just spiritual freedom, in an eternity with God, but freedom in our, in our lives that sometimes we, we, we sometimes just put our hands behind our back and say, go ahead and chain me up. Unknowingly, unknowingly, but we do it. So, deliverance of the captives, recovery of the sight, recovery of sight to the blind, release the oppressed. Now, The words in Luke, this is actually a portion of scripture coming out of Isaiah 61, chapter 61 of Isaiah. And while it is not word for word, um, if you go to Isaiah chapter 61 and read it in your Bibles, these words don't line up exactly for what is there. It's very shortened. But Jesus was trying to get an idea here of what he came to do for these people. You remember, he's talking, he's talking to people who believe in God. He's talking to people who have a relationship as best they know it. He's in the synagogue. That's like going to a church. They don't realize that they were captive, that they were blind, that they were oppressed. And sometimes we fall into that same situation. Sometimes maybe we are captive and don't realize it. Maybe we are blind. Not physically, but maybe spiritually... Okay, maybe not spiritually blind. We'll we'll call it maybe spiritually colorblind. Maybe we are oppressed. And what Jesus is saying is, I want, I, uh, you don't have to live like that. I'm here to set you free. I'm here to give you the freedom that you never had before. What bondage, affliction, or oppression are you facing today? You don't have to let these things determine your life. You don't have to let these things hold you back. You don't have to let these things make you feel guilty or bring doubt into your life. Are you dealing with doubt? Maybe you're held captive by doubt. Maybe doubt is is holding you back. Maybe it's not allowing you to be the person you want to, to be. Maybe you're doubting God's will for your life. Maybe you're doubting the promise that God had made you in your life. There were times in my life that, that I did question, God, did you really call me to minister to people? Because I don't see it happening right now. Maybe you doubt the victory God had said you would have over something. Or doubt, maybe you've been praying for somebody and you doubt their salvation because God just hasn't been, God just hasn't seen me answering your prayer. Sometimes we're held captive by our doubt. And God's saying, you don't have to be a captive. You can be, you can break free. You can't break free on your own. But I am here to set the captives free. Let him set you free of the doubt that you have in your life. And like I said, I'm not talking about doubting Jesus as a savior. I'm talking about instances in your life where you're like going, God, I don't get it. Maybe, maybe you're dealing with a little bit of colorblindness spiritually. 
Maybe you can't see God's favor. Maybe you can't see the blessings that God's promised in your life. Maybe you can't see the peace that he said he was going to give you that everybody else seems to have, but you're like going, I don't get it. I don't, I don't see it. Maybe you don't see that hope that everybody else is confident in. We have a God that clears blindness. We have a God that can take those things you can't see and make them visible again. I don't know, in, on Facebook, there's, I've seen it a couple of times, there's uh, this older gentleman who, um, who was colorblind from birth. Uh, and, and by the picture, I'm, I'm assuming he's probably about 60, late 60s, somewhere in there. Um, and, and for the first time, um, he put on a pair of glasses and was able to see in color. And watching that video, it is amazing. I know you guys don't believe me when I told you that I don't get emotional. Because I've been doing it an awful lot recently. Uh, But I got a little emotional. And it was just watching a video. Because he understood and he saw life in a particular way. And he believed that that is all there was. He heard other people talk about how wonderful colors are. He heard people say, oh, look at that green tree. It's so beautiful. Look at that yellow flower. Look at how deep blue the ocean is or how light blue the sky is. But all he saw was gray. And then he put these glasses on. He couldn't even keep them on. He put them on. And he had to take them off right away because it was, the, the, it was just too much for his, his mind to understand. That's what Jesus wants to do with us as we are serving him, as we are following after him. And we see these things in our lives that, that just seem out of reach for us. God's saying, they're not. They're right here. They're available to you. All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is reach for them, and they're right there. Maybe you're dealing with oppression Maybe, maybe you feel like you're not worth much, or, or maybe you feel like your existence doesn't matter. Maybe you feel your faith isn't strong enough. Maybe you believe, or, or maybe there is somebody out there just spreading lies about you, and it's making your life a little difficult. Maybe, maybe somebody at a job is, maybe your boss is telling you, you can't talk about Jesus around here. Maybe there's some type of, some type of oppression that is put on you that you, you should not be having to bear that weight. Jesus says, my yoke is easy. Your Christian life shouldn't be a difficult burden to bear. In fact, it should be a joyful burden to bear. It's going to be a burden. Don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you that you become a Christian and all of your worries go away. That would be anti-scriptural. What I am telling you is that the burdens won't be heavy. They'll be a joy to bear. But yet we are oppressed by things in our lives. That's not the, the life that God wants you to live. He came so that you could have so much more than that. Jesus brings relief to the oppressed. He wants you to be more than you think you can be. To give you so much more. Are you willing to accept what he has? I want to close in prayer. And uh, I'm not going to have the worship team come up. Because I want this to be more of a, a quiet time between you and God. And I don't want, uh, you stay seated. I want, again, I want you to, 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 I want this to be just a time for you to get alone with God. Okay? And we're going to have a, a little bit of an extended, an extended time. Okay? And I want you to just talk about, talk. Maybe I touched on something in my message 
that resonates in your soul. Maybe I said something that hits you in the heart or in the mind. And you say, God, I need you to set me free. God, I need you to, 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 to put on those, those colored glasses. I need you to, to help me have a joyful burden, not a heavy load that bears me down. I'm going to pray, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to, to talk to God. Don't listen to my words because they're going to be my prayer. I want you to talk to God and talk about your burdens. Talk about your captivity. Talk about your oppression. Your need for spiritual sight. And then I'm going to ask, at the end of my prayer, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up and we'll close in a time of prayer. But let's, let's talk to God. Be honest with him. Share your heart. And let him speak to you. Jesus, we know. We know that you came to save the world. We know that the physical torture that you endured. We even under, understand a little bit of the separation from God that you endured because you love us, because you care about us, that you want to be with us. We understand this. But even more so, you also care about the life we live now this physical life we were walking through, and sometimes the oppression that we feel, Lord, the spiritual colorblindness that finds a way in our lives, that finds a way in my life. Help me not be bound as a captive by my doubts, by the way I think or the way I feel. Help me be set free. Help me rely on you. Help me to cry out to you. Help me to reach out to you. Help me to walk to you. Help me to yearn for your presence. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Stand with me as we close in prayer. Jesus, as we walk out these doors, let us not leave you behind. Let us walk hand in hand with you so that you can walk with us and give us the freedom, give us the sight, give us the power to live the life that you want us to have, to live in victory like we've never known before, to have us the peace and the blessed life that you promised us as we live out your call in our lives. Again, we love you, even though we don't deserve it. I really feel there's somebody here because we're still in an attitude of prayer. You haven't, you haven't given your life to Jesus. You've been, you, you've been struggling. This life seems unfair. This life seems like it's just pulling you down, and you're tired of fighting. You've, you're tired of the no hope. Or maybe you have given your life to Jesus at some point in, li in the past, but you've walked away from it. You, you just abandoned that, that relationship. If that's you, and you want to either recommit or you want to, you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to say, Jesus, I'm tired of doing it on my own. I know I, I, I'm guilty of sin, and, and you died for me. I want to 
I need your forgiveness. I want to turn away from my sin. Come into my life. If, if that's something that you, if that's a prayer you want to pray, I want you to pray with me. In fact, I want everybody to just, just go ahead and repeat after me. And let's say this prayer. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your love. We are sinful people. And we ask for your forgiveness. Come into our lives. Be our Lord. Be our Savior. Help us to turn away from sin. And live wholeheartedly for you. Thank you. Amen.